so uh, so let's continue the discussion on uh, distance measures and So, trace distance and fidelity, this is general discussion that we have been having. And uh, remember essentially that uh, we had classical definitions which are basically And uh, so essentially what I want to do is, um, and then there were quantum analogs of them, rho sigma, which is half trace absolute value rho minus sigma, right, where this absolute value is defined as the square root of A dagger A is the absolute value of it. Right. And let me write the quantum uh, fidelity measure as well between any two states rho and sigma basically is the trace of the square root of rho to the half sigma rho to the half. Right. And essentially what I want to do is, uh, is just discuss examples, applications, so on and so forth today, just properties. So, um, we saw that if rho is basically some r i i i, Right, let me just call it rho i and sigma is some sigma i i i right. then um, you know let me put a tilde there then basically the quantum rho sigma is half trace rho minus sigma right and this quantity can be shown to be equal to the classical you can evaluate that this is these both are the same it's just a part of the consistent definition that we demand okay so what i want to do um, so i had some somebody was telling me that you know generally end up being very abstract. So, I just want to do some examples. Right. So, let us say that I have a probability distribution which is P. Um, and 1 minus P. So, this is my first probability distribution. And the second probability distribution is P plus epsilon 1 minus P minus epsilon. Right, I just take. So what I, I just have some probability distribution. I shift it a little bit, right? So it's a probability distribution um, 
you know for instance of a coin right heads and tails and I am considering two such objects which are slightly the probabilities are slightly different. Then um, the classical distance like let me call this vector p and this vector q. The classical um, trace distance between these two is half sum over the absolute value of the differences. So, half absolute value of p minus p minus p plus epsilon right plus p bar minus p bar minus epsilon right which you can verify is just epsilon. So, and uh, so it has the, it seems to kind of have the, have the reasonable meaning that we want out of a distance measure which is that in the limit that epsilon goes off to 0, p and q become the same probability distribution and the distance between them goes off to basically uh, 0, right. And so this thing tends to 0 essentially with the correct. Um, it looks correct basically. You could play this game for other examples as well, right. Um, so, so for instance, if I take P1, P2, P3, right sums to 1 and then I do P1 plus epsilon, P2 plus epsilon, P3 minus 2 epsilon right then you can essentially find that the distance between these two distributions right right q is defined that way p is defined that way is basically just um, it's 2 epsilon right so if i take epsilon to be positive i could just drop that absolute value around it, right. Right, do you understand how to do this? You just take the difference, you get epsilon plus epsilon, right, which is 2 epsilon plus 2 epsilon, which is 4 epsilon by 2 is 2 epsilon, right. So, it is just quite straightforward. Um, so, what about basically the quantum, right? So, let us take example 3, which where I take rho to be half and half and sigma to be two thirds and one third, right? Then uh, what you can do is you can just calculate basically the quantum version or the classical version. You should check that both of these are the same and it is basically half of the absolute value of half minus one third plus half the absolute value of half minus two third, right. So, well, just to be consistent, does not matter, but so let me just put it correctly, right. And this is like one sixth, right. So, it is just some number, and you can evaluate that this number should be exactly this way. But what I urge you to do is also do it basically the technical way, right. So, just um, so, so to do that I will I'll, I'll just say one or two more things in a second. So, remember that what you are taking is you are taking rho minus sigma, right. Let me call it A and um, let me define this as A. And what I am doing is that the quantum trace distance between rho and sigma is actually defined as half the trace square root a dagger a, right. And so, what that means is that um, is that I can compose the matrix a dagger a, right. A dagger a is a normal matrix, right. 
and um, you should verify that it is actually diagonalizable, right. And uh, so I can write basically with the unity transformation. So I can write this basically as as some S D S dagger, right, where S is some unitary transformation. And then you are computing basically the square root of it, which means that it implies basically that the square root of A dagger A is actually S D to the half S dagger, right, just square S D to the half S dagger, S dagger S in the middle disappears and you just get D half squared which is just D, right, and you get S D S dagger which is just A, right, uh, sorry A dagger A. So the square root of uh, basically a diagonalizable matrix, you just have to take the square root of the diagonal part basically, right. So there are the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors and all you have to do is just, is just to remove the eigenvalues, uh, eigenvectors and just, and just transform on the eigenvalues, right. And so what you should then do, then you actually have this entire object and you just need the trace of it. Right, so the trace of square root a dagger a actually does not care about s at all, it is just the trace of d to the half, right, divide by 2. So that is the formal procedure. So the definition that I wrote down right last, last class and today, essentially the way you would work through that if I just gave you a complicated looking matrix is da da da, right. And what is guaranteed by the normal uh, matrix structure of a dagger a? is that it is actually diagonalizable, so you, you do not have to worry about it. So if you imagine basically A to have some complex eigenvalues, right, then they appear essentially as complex conjugate pairs, so you actually just get mod squared of the, of the, in the eigenvalues and they are quite nice, right, so, so these kinds of matrices have very nice properties and you can deal with them. So uh, because the definition of uh, the quantum has a half. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I should have a half there as well, yeah. So you can verify by doing that 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 is indeed the case, right. So example 4, so let us deploy it for an example. So like example 4, so let us take a density matrix which is half, half and another density matrix which looks quite similar, right. And so do you realize that these are actually quite different from each other as density matrices go? Rho is actually a maximally mixed state, right. The block vector decomposition of it is at the center of the block sphere, right. And it represents basically no information. You have no, the, no measurement actually produces any, any information, right. So it is the, it's, it's, it's the, it's the state which has the least amount of information that is sitting in it, right. Um, we will quantify what this word information means uh, quantitatively very soon. But sigma on the other hand is just the eigenstate um, of the poly sigma x matrix just written in the outer product form. If you take 1 over square root 2, 1 over square root 2, the plus x eigenstate, then you just take the outer product of it, you just get that, right. And so we can compute basically what matrix A is. The matrix A is rho minus sigma, right. And so it is basically 0 minus half minus half 0, right, which is the which is the same as minus half times the poly sigma x matrix, right. And so what is A dagger A? It is one fourth times the identity matrix, right. What is the square root of A dagger A? It is the square root of that which is one half the identity matrix. What is the trace of this? right, it is just 1 because the trace of identity is 2 divided by 2 is 1. So you can compute that the quantum trace distance between these two is just a half, right. Right, so there is many halves floating around, so just be, just be a bit aware, right. So one half comes essentially from the fact that uh, I have, um, you know, the final half so I, when I take the trace of this, this half disappears, but then the definition of the trace distance has another half and that is the only one that shows up, right. Okay. So let me give you an, ex an, ex an exercise that you should work out right now. So let us consider rho 
to be one fourth three fourths and sigma again to be our favorite half 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 right and so actually work out what the trace distance is let me know when one of you has it you have the answer okay anyone else okay sid what do you have upon 2 what do you have square root 5 by 4 right so it turns out that that's the correct answer so let's see how and there's a little lesson in it actually so compute a first right a is basically minus one fourth uh, one fourth one half one half with a minus sign right so I've just taken rho minus sigma you could avoid all these minus signs by just taking basically sigma minus rho right there's just some judicious choice which just produces least number of minus signs it doesn't matter at all basically as you'll see in a second so I can of course write this as minus one half times sigma x plus sigma z over 2, right, we should verify that this is actually a, and that minus sign will never contribute because a dagger a will just kill that minus sign, right. So, a dagger a basically is 1 fourth times sigma x square plus sigma z square over 4 plus sigma x sigma z plus sigma z sigma x over 2 that quantity you can check is actually 0 right sigma x and sigma z anti commute right. So, um, so that quantity is 0 and what that means is what you have is 1 fourth times 1 plus 1 fourth times the identity operator right which is 5 16th the identity operator which means that square root a dagger a is 5 fourths the identity square root 5 over 4 the identity operator which means that the trace of this quantity right is square root 5 over 4 times 2 and when you divide by 2 this goes away right now here is a an important thing right um, so if you calculate square root 5 is what like 2.2 something right uh, so I think square root 5 is like 2.25 2 right uh, somewhere there 2.22 or something so square root 5 over 2 will be like 1.18 it will just be critically larger than 1 right and that's somewhat of a um, of a tip off because what you can show is that if you take rho to be 1 plus r dot sigma divided by 2 you should do this and uh, sigma sorry for the the, the unvectorized sigma is the density matrix or let me call it row 1 and row 2 is 1 plus s dot sigma divided by 2 right if I have two density matrices which are poly density matrices which look like this then basically the trace distance between them is actually the Euclidean distance divided by 2 between the two vectors and the block vectors can only be between 0 and 1 right which means that the largest that you can arrange this entire quantity to be is just actually plus 1 right so square root 5 over 4 which is basically about a half right uh, is still okay right and so okay so this is just basically uh, to get you to get you some practice on 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 trace distances so typically um, it takes a little bit of time to get used to this but you know you should just uh, i mean i uh, we, you know we've done i think enough uh, examples where you you presumably get the hang of it it's quite straightforward to do it 
um, you know, I've only ever bothered myself with doing the uh, qubit versions of it because just the poly algebra manipulation is quite straightforward, but it's a bit messier for other things, but you can still do it. It's just basically your standard basically diagonalization of matrices, right. Um, so, I just give you a normal operator, you just diagonalize it, you get this, you know, you get the eigenvalues, blah, blah, blah. It's not. No, uh, there's no, there's nothing particularly great about all of these uh, prefactors. So, remember the tra that distance measures basically the most important thing about them is that they basically have to have this, uh, have these three properties which is, uh, they should be positive semi definite and with zero if and only if the states onto itself, right. The element is, a, the elements that you're comparing are the same, it should be symmetric, it should obey the triangle inequality, right. Now, on top of it, you can basically now say, hey, it would be convenient if the smallest distance is all already zero. It would be con convenient if the largest distance between any two objects can only be one, right. So, the normalization is just a condition that's imposed on top, right. So, I the it would be convenient is is where you should understand the normalization from. So, this causes some sort of some some level of confusion. So, even for density matrices, right, I mean the way you write the poly representation 1 plus r dot sigma divided by 2 is a choice. I mean if I do not write the divided by 2, I just get different normalization over the entire set, right. I need the half in front of the identity matrix for trace preservation, but I do not need it in front of the r, right. And that is a choice I am making, right. And so exactly the same, if you look at the Fano representation, basically there is, you know, some square root ends floating around which are essentially just meant to make the algebra look a little bit better, right. And so, you will see in different textbooks like, so if you open kind of, you know, there are actually conventions to define this, these things. So, some people will define them with halves in front, some people will define them with other numbers in front. There is a, these, th the ones that I am writing now are fairly standard, so this is not, yeah. Uh-huh. The length of the vector is 0 to 1, the, 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 because of the direction as well, this can go from minus 1 to 1, but then you can only, the largest it can be is 2, which is divided by 2. So, that was all I meant, yeah. Okay. So, uh, remember the crucial bit of the, bit of the maths that I just want you to, again, before we walk away from trace distances and, you know, I stop talking about it. Um, the crucial bit of the maths that I want you to remember is just over here, right. That, that's where all the magic is basically, is nothing. Okay. So, I want to share with you some additional properties. So, property number one that I want to share with you is that the distance right is uh, invariant under unitary transformations. The second uh, thing that I want to share with you is rho sigma max over projectors. I will explain what this means. Let me just write all of this and then we will we'll talk our way through it.
okay. So, there are five properties that I want to share with you. So, um, property number one, right, uh, this is unit invariance. So, if you take a density matrix, if you take two density matrices and you ask how far are they, right, and you get the answer half, right. If you basically take both of those density matrices, just imagine this on the block sphere and this is the simplest way to actually imagine. So, I have two density matrices, right, one is pointing along my middle finger and the other one's pointing along my, you know, pointing finger, right. And uh, and then I basically just perform a unitary transformation. What does a unitary transformation do? It rotates each density matrix, but it rotates it by the same amount in the same direction. So essentially all that it does is it just rotates them like that, right. And all that this thing says is that that can't change the distance. It ought not to change the distance because you are just basically rotating both of them by the same amount, right. And the second is basically, uh, the second, third, fourth, fifth are actually very, very important properties which you should, uh, which you should know and they kind of give you a flavor of let us say a graduate course in this, uh, um, in this area which uh, would kind of go into really the depths of uh, calculations that are, that are quite like this. So, it is quite a nice thing for you to get used to now. So, what this thing says is it basically says the following. So, it says suppose P's are projectors, right. What that means is P square is P, right. So, if P's are a, a P is a projective measurement, what it is saying is that if you try and basically you have two density matrices, right and you suspect basically so, let me imagine that these are, uh, these are quantum states that exist on a real line just like space, right. So, it is essentially like as if I, I just have a wave function that is coming at me and what I suspect is the following. I suspect that rho actually looks like that, right, but sigma, um, you know, rho actually looks like that, right and sigma on the other hand basically looks like that. Right? I'm being cartoonishly. Uh, I'm I'm being very cartoonish about it. But um, let's say that these this is what it looks like, right? Then what you would do is you'd basically say, aha! Actually, there is something I can do, which is I just put a mask. I have a. I want to build a detector, right? And so I put a mask, right? A thick metal plate which simply blocks this left half and leaves open the right half, right? So I put a mask like this and I put a big big detector here right. And if I put this big detector here, what am I doing? I am projecting basically, I do not know that this is a projector, it is actually a POVM, but it does not matter. But I am essentially only allowing light from one, from one half of my, of my detection plane, right, to come through. And I know because you just told me what the wave functions look like, I know that that measurement actually can discriminate very strongly whether I have this wave function or that wave function, right. So, basically to say this in, in, in slightly more mathematical words, what it is saying is it is saying suppose you have rho and sigma and somewhere rho and sigma the support is different, right. So, there exists, there, you remember from last class I had told you, imagine that there are two kind, two dies, right, that I bring in front of you. One of them can never roll to a 6. 6 is, is one of the painted sides on the die, but you can never roll to a 6, right. I rig the die in such a way that you can never roll to a 6. Then you are actually what you should be looking for, the measurement you should be looking for is 6 because the other one can. And the moment you, you hit the 6, you basically can conclude, ah, this is die A and not die B, right. In exactly the same way basically, if you know that there is some kind of measurement that optimally, that maximally discriminates, not optim, maximally discriminates basically between rho and sigma, right, which essentially means the one that maximizes the difference in the two, uh, uh, the two surprises that you, you know, the two probabilities that you would expect then that measurement is the one that you should be performing, right. And this is the way you would try and discriminate between two states. What this equation is saying, equation number 2 is saying, is it saying if you try and maximize over such a projective measurement, if the measurement that you have is a projective measurement, if you try and maximize over the set of all projective measurements, a way in which you can discriminate, you know, this is the probability that you will hit rho is basically if you measure rho, the probability that you will see p is p rho, right, expectation value p rho. The difference in the probabilities if you try and maximize so that it gives you the kind of maximal measurement that you can perform. This probability, right, is basically just the distance between them. So, the larger the distance, the larger the probability that you will actually be able to discriminate them, right. So, this thing goes into kind of the, uh, the, the uh, uh, error probability associated with being able to discriminate two quantum states right. And so, this is something that I want to prove and then I want to talk about it. 
The third thing is basically something that I won't prove because it's slightly more technical. Uh, it's straightforward, but I'll just leave it for um, leave it for now. Is basically it's saying suppose I take a different point of view, right? So you have to always remember that quantum and classical, both quantum mechanics and classical mechanics are always on our minds, right? So you can basically say the following: you can say, hey, I don't care about your fancy POVMs, I don't care about your fancy, um, you know, projective measurements and so on and so forth. I am going to take the following point of view. I am going to say everything that hits a detector is a probability. And so at the end of the day, I do not care about quantum mechanics. All I have are probability theories, right? I just have some detection probabilities, PMs and QMs, right? And now I ask you the following question. I say, hey, you have two probabilities, PM and QM. So they are exactly like the probability of landing one of the six numbers on a die, right? PM is for, is for die A, P, uh, QM is for die B. You just have some complicated version of it. It's not a die, it's actually a quantum state, whatever. I don't care. Now, can you just tell me what the maximum difference between the two probability distributions is, right? The classical pro uh, distance between the two probability distributions. Maximum, why? Because you could perform a really bad measurement, right? Let's say that, that just like my example, right? let's say the number six is where you should be looking. You could look over, you know, you could look at number one, number two, number three, number four, or number five. And you would essentially not be able to tell the difference whether it was A or B, right? But if number six basically has zero and one and non-zero on the other, that's really where you should be looking, right? Is, is what it says. So also suppose like number number one, both have probabilities, but one is an incredibly low probability, the other is an incredibly high probability, right? For die B, because it, you know, in, in, in lieu of basically having probability for six, probability for six, this event six is zero, but the probability for event one is almost one, right? Then again, you should basically be looking at, at one as well, right? I mean, that also tells you all of the interesting information that you want to know. So to go back to this, right, and to try and read this, what this is saying is it's saying, if I forget about quantum mechanics for a second, or if I use quantum mechanics to just produce an underlying probability distribution PM and QM, which is just the measurement record that I got upon performing a measurement EM, I can ask the question, what is the classical trace distance between these two probability distributions? Well, if you mess up, right, if you're really, really bad at making, uh, at making a choice of a good measurement operator, you can get these numbers wrong, right? I mean, you could get, you could get a bad number here, right? But if you try and maximize over the set of all measurements, if you basically consider all measurements cleverly and then pick the one that is the best, then you can do no better, essentially. All you will end up back at is the trace distance. So do you see why between, by the time I go from, go to 2 and 3, it should be very clear why we are calculating trace distances, right? Trace distances actually tell you how to discriminate. They are the, they are related to the error probability of discriminating quantum states, right? And this is one of the most important things that I can share with you about trace distances, which is when you go off, like when you, when you basically do experiments, for instance, right? And you want to actually say, hey, I have the, I want to make a particular target state row. Right? But I actually have an NV center and the NV center has, you know, is coupled to a nucleus and because of this coupling there is decoherence and there is T1, T2 star, whatever, whatever and, you know, and my actual thing that comes out is a little different, it's some sigma, right? Now, operationally speaking, how different is rho from sigma, right? If you have not produced rho, you've technically failed, right? But in reality, have you failed? This is a question that you should always ask, right? Because experiments are, are always more complicated than writing an idealized theory. And the answer, the in reality answers are all related to things like the probability of being able to discriminate rho from sigma. Given your measurement set, right, given your measurement constraints, if you can't even tell them apart, then you've done well enough, right? And you could conclude essentially that you've, you've, you've produced rho for all, for all practical purposes, right? So these kinds of arguments, I mean, there are some finer arguments here, but like these kinds of arguments you, you will engage in. And to engage in these arguments, you need this toolbox, right? This is the point I want to make to you. So let me just take you through just two more things. Um, maybe I'll just prove these at 11 o'clock and then we can continue on from there. I'll make such proofs for fidelity as well at 11. Um, so the, the other two things that I want to explain to you are this object, which is basically just the triangle inequality for uh, the quantum version of trace distances, right? And so I will not write quantum and classical, nobody does this. I started writing it just to kind of ease you into the subject. But you know, you can just tell by looking at what's, what functions they're taking, right? This is, this is operator overloading, right? Uh, uh, by just, by just looking at how I'm 
how I am calling these functions, you should be able to tell exactly what the what the object underneath is, right? So this is triangle inequality, and we'll just prove this. It's two lines once you understand how to actually deal with this object. And the very last thing, which is which is essentially the literally the most important thing, one of the most important things that quantum information theory has taught us, especially those of us who are interested in kind of the intersection of information theory and thermodynamics, is um, the following, which is so where, you know this and its cousins are essentially quite very very important and and what this says is something very very profound right what it says is it says imagine that i have a cp map phi right so i want to discriminate two quantum states so here are two quantum states right i want to discriminate them and i have i have two options option 1 is i can take my two quantum states right Right. I don't know what this is. Maybe they're the they're the they're the vapor cells in which the atoms are sitting, right? But they're just abstract representations of the state, right? Of the physical system, sorry. Right? Now I have two options. Option one, I can just measure them now. Right? I can measure them now and tell try and tell them apart. Or option two, I can basically send them through some through some channel that tries to process them. Right? So, what is this phi? How does the density matrix transform in quantum mechanics in general? CP maps, right? I mean, I don't know why you're super unsure. Is this a trick question? No, it isn't, right? It's just so all that phi can be is a CP map, right? So there is a system and then there is always an environment and can interact with the environment you forget about it, blah, right. So now the question that I am asking is the following which is I want to be able to tell these two apart should I do it here or should I actually get them to interact with some you know with some additional spin that I have lying around and then maybe if I measure you know now if I measure basically what comes out right. Right what comes out maybe it's better right and the answer that the, that this thing tells you unequivocally is actually the only thing that it can be is worse right so it's telling you the the probability that you right so what this is is that this is the this is the this is related to the error probability right so the larger this quantity is the lower the error probability right so if the if the if if d of rho comma rho is zero right i mean uh, this is by definition by construction Right? And what that means is if I give you two copies of a quantum state, you actually can't tell them apart. Right? They're ident they're tautologically identical. Right? By definition, they're identical. Right? So in exactly the same way, if I give you rho and sigma which are very, very close to each other, then it's very, very hard to tell them apart. Right? So on and so forth. And what this is, is it's a monotone relationship. What it's saying is every time you try and bring a machine to put these two quantum states in, so that you post process them and then you can try and try and find that the only thing that will happen is they'll get closer to each other which means they'll get harder to discriminate right and this is an important so there are analogs of this in in communication theory as well which is i have a i have two messages and i want to tell them apart should i actually put them through a communication channel or not right yeah yeah so the the in fact when the cp map is when the uh, you can have no it's complicated right so when the cp map is unitary then you basically just have this number 1 right it's just number 1 when the cp map is not unitary you could have basically some slightly weird things where you take your two quantum states and put their support in some subspace but then all your cp map does is act in another subspace and so it doesn't actually touch your quantum states so it doesn't do anything right so you can have you can have stuff like that happen Right, it performs an effective rotation or something like that, right? So you have to be a bit more careful that you know you have to actually do the do the work, right? But effectively, yeah, you're right that you're right that one is essentially just a, a, um, the equality condition for um, for five, right? So one is a subset of five. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm I'm out of time. So let me just stop here. So what I'll do at eleven is basically uh, prove some of these things. It takes a it's straightforward, but it takes like you know um, a little bit of arguing to get through these and then what I'll do is for fidelity as well I basically have around four or five uh, 
statements that I want to make. I have some examples and so on and so forth. So let's get through them and then we'll be good to go. Okay. Cheers.